This is the time, this is the place, and this is FC3 Monkey Business, your one-stop shop for everything geeky. And since everything is geeky, if you love it enough, you never know what you're going to get. This is your host, I am C. This week, we'll be talking about Dungeons & Dragons in the schools with Ethan Schoonover. And after that, stick around for our upcoming events and our question of the week. How are we doing, gang? Everybody good? We're all here? With me as always, the ever irrepressible Billy DeTori. Hello, Billy. Hello, Chris. Are we having fun yet today? So far. Hey, happy early birthday to your sister. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, Tomorrow is of our taping, so yes. Yep, absolutely. And, and then to my, my right, the uh, ever malevolent lately, Tanya Metris. <laughs> She's been threatening me left, right, and center today. Only because you keep picking on me. Well, it's because you keep picking back. So that's yeah, all, well. you know, it's one of those things. It becomes a vicious cycle. This keeps going around mm-hmm. and around mm-hmm. and around. So I'm going to get my ass kicked today somewhere along the line. To my left in the studio, not on the phone, our beloved producers, Chris and Sherry. Hi, guys. Good to see the both of you. Hello. I would say morning, but it's now afternoon. Yes, we so are now in the afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon to you as well. And uh, to, and good evening if you happen to be listening to this podcast at night while you're trying to get ready for sleep. And, and then off on the far left at the far end of the table, the bouncing baby boy himself. Hello, Ian. Yes. How are you? I'm great. You are? Yes. And it's so nice that your mother is going to volunteer to pick up your keys at somebody else's house. Yes. Because she locked herself out. Yes. And so there's a convoluted way of getting her into the house at this point. So Nothing better than confusion in the morning. I'm telling you, that's a mainstay in this family. It's definitely you, better that you were closer to the mic at that point, Ian, because you seem to be a little far apart. A little I like bit. moving. Yeah, yeah, well, don't do that. Yeah. Uh, so Billy's sister's having a birthday. Tanya, you're getting a new pool. Mm-hmm. Chris and Sherry made muffins and... Uh, and it, the muffins are delicious. The muffins are very good. Thank yes. you. We're, we're muffing it up in, in, this, uh, in the studio at the I moment. I had a chocolate chip. Yay. I had two. I, I, well, I didn't have two muffins. I had, I had also a chocolate chip muffin. I had a black cap last night, and it now, was amazing. What, is what the hell is a black cap? They're, they're basically like black raspberries. Oh, oh cool. Mm-hmm. Okay. They, they're, they're much earlier than raspberries and black raspberries. Nice. Mm-hmm. So they're like Paleolithic. They're, they're, we're, he's like from the dinosaur era. I didn't mean that early. Okay, that early. <laughs> I meant early in the year. Oh, earlier in the season. year in the harvesting season. Gotcha. Okay, I just thought there were like maybe like one of the oldest berries ever. That's what I'm eating right now. That's a dingleberry. I will try one. Thank you. What's that? It was a dingleberry. Yeah, so that's, just that's one of the earliest. <laughs> no, one of the early <laughs> types of berries. Okay. No muffins out of those, please. <laughs> I really, really hope not. Ah, mm. uh, on you guys. But knowing Sherry, she probably would make it taste really good. Yeah, she probably would. <laughs> It's entirely want to find out. No, we're good with that. Don't make her mad. And I don't know what want to know how she got them. <laughs> well, we had a Time wild travel. dingleberry harvest this weekend, mm-hmm. and we. No, never mind. Yeah, you, you, were, you were on a zo- you were in a zone, but then Stop. lost it. See, now listening to this conversation, this sparkling repartee between between the the six of us here in this room at the moment. We're don't sorry. you want to sponsor Monkey Business? I think you would love to sponsor <laughs> Monkey Business and, and Flower City Comic Con because this is the kind of conversations you would be able to foster and help produce on a weekly basis. If you're interested in sponsoring FC3 Monkey Business and the Flower City Comic Con, please contact us. At sponsorships at fc3roc.org. Or you can just email me at chris at fc3roc.org. See how I segued into the actual you business? Did. So, you're so proud of me, I can tell. And then there we have Patreon. What is Patreon? Patreon is a membership platform that makes it easy for you to support Monkey Business and the Flower City Comic Con. Please check us out at www.patreon.com backslash FC3ROC. All membership levels will include access to the Patreon-only blog, plus tons of great perks at all levels, including early podcast Twitch and Flower City Comic Con information. Shout out to two of our amazing patrons, Jen Bevan and Jen Green. Thank you for supporting us, Jennifers. It was great to... Yes, go ahead. Before we move on to the next one, I just want to give a small shout out to one of our other patrons. Absolutely. Who's having a birthday today. (gasps) We do have a patron with a birthday today, don't we? Ever amazing Anne. Anne Liebick, our, our, what, she's staff she's she's everything she's adjunct board <laughs> she's she of is all trades <laughs> master yeah she is not the jack of all trades master of none master. she is the master of all trades absolutely and so, she is the awesome so and as of taping her birthday is today, today. yep so uh, happy 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 birthday and we love you all right moving on we're talking about apple podcasts 
want to help others find the show, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. This is the single easiest way to support the show and encourage others to listen. Every review will be thanked on the air. Excuse me. And any questions will be answered, muffins. (laughs) (laughs) We want to be a conversation, so please send us your questions and we'll be happy to conduct that with you. In addition to Apple Podcasts, you can find us on Google Play, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and Stitcher. Is there a place you find your podcast but you can't find FC3 Monkey Business? Let us know and Sherry will see about fixing that for you. And please follow us on Twitter at FC3 MB Podcast. And if you do, say hi, because we love it when you say hi, because we will say hi back. We will. Hello. We will. Hello. What's that? Hi. Remember that, that Dudley Moore movie from way back in the 80s? Um, Arthur? No, not, not, not <laughs> that one. That's my brain went. There was the one where they were like ad execs, and he was an ad exec yes. in an insane asylum. Oh, God. What was that? I can't remember. And, and it was David Paymer played the character who um, all he could say was hello. So they had the whole musical number around him saying hello. I want to find that. We'll do that again. Hello. Oh, they, they, Hello. Were, they were doing that. They, uh, Volvo. Yes. They're we're boxy, boxy. But, but we're, we're good. good. <laughs> See, you know the movie I'm talking about. Hold That's on. All. I'm working on it. Uh-oh. <laughs> She's on it. I'm working on She's it. She's on it. We're While good. Tanya's doing that, we're, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to have Ethan Schoonover on the air. We're going to be talking a little bit about Dungeons and Dragons in schools. That and seems odd. I'm looking forward to, to this discussion. <laughs> I got to tell you. So it's good stuff. Uh, I love it when we can break Chris during the break. All right. I'm going to pass out. Nah, it's all good. Holy crap. Ethan Schoonover is the technical director at the Lake Washington Girls Middle School in Seattle. Seattle, Washington. He is also dungeon master of a very special after-school club we all wish we could have belonged to. The official D&D club at LWGMS. Begun as a D&D club, it has expanded into a full elective, making him possibly the coolest teacher ever. Ethan, welcome to the show, sir. Hi, Chris. Thank you very much for having me on. Absolutely. I was going to say, did we lose him already? <laughs> <laughs> we are trained professionals. Remember, we we know how to work a phone. Um, no, I mean, I, I, my journey with D&D, and I'm going to ask you about yours, is, is this fall will turn 30. And so sure. I've played every permutation of this game, and and I've always wanted to... Uh, I've, I've looked forward to it becoming as mainstream as it's become as of late. And now you've managed to take it even a step further. And, and I, it's actually like an official on-the-books elective at the school. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It's actually an official elective, um, which, I mean, it surprised me as much as it surprises everybody else. Uh-huh. I think, um, you know, we started off as, uh, as a club. And, mm-hmm. you know, the club itself was not very old when all of this uh, sort of transformed. Okay. But, you know, we started in January, January of 2018, mm-hmm. and uh, this was um, the the origin story. There is actually uh, kind of interesting. Um, the girls at LWGMS are, are sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, and you know this this whole new world of Dungeons and Dragons streaming online and Twitch mm-hmm. that doesn't exist for them. You know, they, for them, D and D is something that their parents have played. Okay. Um, and sadly. Sadly for them, most of it, it's mostly just their dads, uh, historically. Right. And that's, you know, it, so it's, it's either their dad's nerdy game or they saw Stranger Things. And oh. and that's it. That was, you know, for them, that's D&D. Huh. So how does, how does that yeah. coalesce? Yeah. So, Go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead. No, no. So, um, so what happened is uh, one of the girls had seen Stranger Things. And came up, you know, we were talking, and she knew, somehow she knew that I had, you know, played D&D. And she really just kind of yeah, latched onto that and decided, you know, we, we need to start a D&D club. And she kept pestering for me about this. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mentioned my interest in doing that, and she just did not let up. And fi- so finally I just decided we have to make this happen. And we found a time slot, which was Friday night, mm-hmm. uh, which, by the way, if you teach middle schoolers, that's pretty much the worst night of the week to try to <laughs> do anything with them. At the end of the week, and they're tired, and, you know, they're their brains are shut down, but yeah, it's great. I mean, you know, it's a testament to how engaging D and D is. They were they were absolutely there and present for it. We had six girls initially, and uh, after the success of that, then a brand, you know, it, our, our dean of teaching came to me and said, "Hey, maybe we turn this into an elective during the day." That's cool. Now, how does how do you turn that into a class? Is it is it something that you you discuss 
tactics and history of the of the game, or is it just the, the classwork you're still playing the game on a regular basis? Yeah, it's, I think it's really important to play the game, mm-hmm. um, and I, I you know I look at it as a clothesline of engagement. So it's sort of this clothesline that you can hang other things off. Of. Okay. So the girls are playing the game; they're engaged with the game. But we can hang academics off that. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not pretending to be teaching math or history or mm-hmm. anything like that in the class specifically, but we can, inter, you know, we can inject these academics into it. So we, have, we do play games. We play a game. And I, I think pretty much without exception, uh, other than a few classes, we played a session every class. Okay. Um, and then on the back of that, we would do things like I would, in, I would inject them like mathematics and have them do calculations of area like how big is this chamber given these dimensions and, and calculate the volume. At one point we had a, a battle with a snake made of mist and they had to calculate the volume of mist in the chamber itself. So that's we phenomenal. Could do like that we could, uh, we could do, obviously we could do creative writing. Uh-huh. Uh, I had the girls write backstories for the characters. Um, we did a lot of art. So there were there and there's so much more that we could do. We oh, could absolutely. Do, yeah. You know, imagine um, like economics history, and research. Yeah. 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 So, you know, one of the things I'm trying to work on this summer while we have some downtime is really trying to prepare uh, a, a more intensive curriculum based around D&D. Mm-hmm. May I recommend that the senior thesis be the Tomb of Annihilation? <laughs> <laughs> and they all die. Yes. <laughs> And you graduate. There you go. Congratulations. Tomb of Horrors. And, Come no, on. That's it. Tomb, that's, tomb, tomb of Horrors. Tomb of Horrors is, is the master class, and anybody who survives is, the one, is allowed to graduate. That's oh. that's how you... <laughs> if they get right, past that go, last yeah. trap yeah. that doesn't kill the entire party. There you go. Like, like right. you sprung like, for us. No, right. Sean did it. Anyway. Um, so tell us about the, the first campaign that the girls went on. Uh, so the first campaign, so this was all me doing homebrew okay. campaign for them. And okay. part of this, part of this was, I just, you know, I, I, I run the technology at the school and I'm a department of one. Uh, we have 110 <laughs> girls in the school and we have, uh, maybe 20, let's say approximately uh, 25, uh, faculty and staff. And I'm actually the only man in the school. So, oh, wow. But you know, I have, I have general responsibilities, uh, during the day. And so I don't have a ton of time to prepare. Uh, so a lot of it was just my homebrew campaign, and the girls start off. And I, you know, I thought real hard about this. What I actually did something a little unusual, uh, I think, for most players of D and D, and it comes from sort of the, uh, I guess, it was inspired by the way that I got back into role playing games, which we can talk about later. Absolutely. But, uh, I start them off at level zero. Okay. So, so level is... zero, they are they are villagers. Uh-huh. They have no class. Um, they choose a race. They roll up some ability scores, and that's really it. That's about all we do for, in the first kind of like five or ten minutes of the, the first session. And then after that, we just uh, jump right into the story, and they start figuring out how to role play, figuring out like, okay, when do we roll the dice? What, is, what, are, what are these dice? Mm-hmm. What does it mean to do an ability check? What does it mean to do a saving throw? And, and slowly I start to introduce more complicated uh, concepts. And, uh, you know, eventually we're doing things like, okay, let's talk a little bit about alignment. So the first time they had a, a battle, we met, met some kobolds. Um, they rescued this child from the kobolds. And one of the girls, and then they tied up the kobolds. And then one of the girls says, well, I think we should kill the kobolds. And I said, okay, this is a great time for us to talk about alignment. Like, what would your characters do in this case? And let's figure out what your character's alignment is. And they mm-hmm. decided after doing that that they wouldn't, their characters wouldn't actually kill the kobolds. They would just, they would, you know, keep them captive. Okay. And then it develops from there. And, and I'm assuming that's when also you started introducing classes so that they could start kind of figuring out what, what their skill sets are going to be. Well, you know, we actually went through almost an entire sort of initial adventure without any um, actual class. Oh, that's and cool. I guess, you know, you could say that sort of means they were general, like, fighters. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they, did, they had some sort of improvised weapons. They had their, um, they all had a little bit of a background. Some of them were like a glass blower or uh, could be, you know, some, one of them was like a hunter. And mm-hmm. So they each had things that they could use as weapons and, when they were exploring. But, you know, I let them do a little bit of everything. If they want to try to take a lock, they can do it. Um, they might find a scroll that they could use to get a little bit of taste of magic. Mm-hmm. But yeah, as we went through, it was sort of a classic, you know, there was a little bit of outdoor exploration. There was some dungeon crawling. Uh, and then there were some hints at a larger story and a little bit of mystery. And along the way, they, they adopted this little girl into their party who was an NPC. And that connects up. So that was my Friday night club. Later on, when I had the class start, I actually had the class start in the same world, but in a different village. And uh, they, they had a different storyline involving the mother of the little girl. And so the two groups, even though they were playing at different times of the day and different times of the week, 
uh, their stories started to converge, and they started to like. Once they figured that out, mm -hmm. they would not stop talking with each other. <laughs> they like constantly, like kind of gossiping about what was going on in their campaign, which was great. It was like a whole third kind of gaming session for them. Th that's amazing. That is outstanding. Yeah. Okay, so <sighs> I'm just absorbing that right now. So I'm I'm kind of like rolling through some ideas. Did, did you guys have questions right now? Because I'm just kind of rolling. Actually, through Actually, I just had a comment. Go I ahead. think. Everybody who plays could benefit from that. Yeah. Absolutely. I was just reading an article the other day where there, were there was DMs talking about starting everybody off at zero level. That's, and, that's and just, just making wonderful. them average commoners and letting them kind of feel the world out, especially like if it's a, if it's a homebrew world or if it's something that people are not – players are not used to. Uh, like the world I DM in, I've been building for 30 years now I've been from scratch. And so I'm the only one who really knows everything about it. And even then, I'm still learning something new. <laughs> You know, so it's 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 cool to have that kind of that ability to really feel like you're part of the story by not really having any preconceived notions about what you are and what you can do. I don't know it's just, it's just a cool thing. How many girls are playing now overall? So we ended the year we had fourteen girls that were playing. Mm -hmm. That's a combination of both the Friday Night Club and then the daytime elective class. Um, we're running a summer camp this summer for mm -hmm. a week, which will be a D and D summer camp. Nice, uh, and that'll have about fourteen girls in it as well. <laughs> I want wow. to go to that. It's the week of July twenty third. So, I looked. Is it okay? <laughs> so, as as new freshmen come in your school, this is something that they'll be able to sixth graders, uh, sixth graders, oh, they're six, seven, eight. Eight. six okay. seven eight, it's a middle school. Yeah. Okay. Well, as new girls come into yeah. the school, they'll they'll be able to join this right from the ground floor as they come in the school. That's yeah, cool. absolutely. So we're already. Uh, I've already locked in the, the the Friday night for this coming year. Very cool. We're going to start the year with the Friday night club again, and uh, the dean of teaching has already approached me again about doing the elective uh, in the coming year as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely going to happen. I'm actually trying to expand it this year. I've recruited uh, some folks in Seattle uh, to be dungeon masters, uh, co-dungeon masters with me, so we can try to increase the number of girls that get to play in the evening. Very cool. And uh, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, and, you know, this is I, – I would love to see this model. And I, so what I'm, one of the things I'm doing, obviously, I'm trying to create curriculum around this, um, create some sort of basic structure, of like, you know, what, what's a good model for doing an after-school club like this? And I know other folks have done that at other schools, but what I'm trying to do is just to codify it, make some, get some documentation together and mm -hmm. get some stuff together that I can share out to other schools and other folks that are interested in doing this. Now, to jump onto that, um, this is Tanya – my uh, son, who's now 19, he, um, the high school he went to actually had a role-playing club in it. Um, so for our grades 10, 11, 12, he actually played D&D &D at school. I think it was on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, it was his uh, um, forensic science teacher that was like the main DM or the person that was interested in it. And they had, I think, about 20 or 25 students rotating in through the high school, um, and it was other um, teens that were also DMing and things like that. So that, I think that's just, like, really cool. So um, it's yeah. out in other districts, too. Yeah, yeah. So th that's actually, you bring up a really good point, Tanya, which is the idea of other students becoming Dungeon Masters. And that is something that I'm definitely keen to try. Um yeah, I didn't do it last year because I wanted all the girls. I wanted to kind of control the experience a little bit. So, mm -hmm. you know, these these are all. So, just to give a little bit of background. So, I I grew up in the '70s and '80s in center, in rural Wisconsin, and I you know, which was sort of the, the birthplace of D and D. Right. And you know, fantasy literature back then, Dungeons and Dragons back then, that was really created. It was created for people like me, right? I was like a you know a, a white boy in the Midwest and. Fantasy literature and fantasy games were really accessible to me. And so I look at it now and I think, well, this is really something that I'm trying to, you know, open that gateway up mm -hmm. to these girls so that they can, they have a sense of ownership of that game. They have a sense of ownership of Dungeons and Dragons. And so to that end, I wanted to make sure that their first experiences were kind of controlled and really positive experiences um, and, and that they all felt really welcome and, and came away with that sense of ownership. Um, and that was one of the reasons why I started the, the after school club, because I, I could tell that this, you know, particular, a couple students had such interest and I was talking it up so much that I felt like they might go out and go to a friendly local game store. And I didn't know what kind of experience they would have. Maybe it would be a great experience. Maybe it would be an awkward experience. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that. To, I didn't want them to come away from that awkward experience and think, oh, it, you know, that's not for me. Yeah, now, th this is Billy. And I, I'm, I'm going to. 
deviate from Dungeons and Dragons for just a second because you said you grew up in the 70s and 80s, and I did too. Everyone else here is a little bit younger than me. And your job, are, are you like the Mrs. Garrett in Facts of Life? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. I've been called the dad of LWGMS uh-huh. and some of the students. I've been called, oh, and you know, I I joke that I kind of run the um, the Stranger Things curriculum at LW because I, I do things like I run you're like the the, the one the one man in um, an all girls school, and all I could think are like Blair and Tootie and Natalie and and Joe and this girls yeah. school, and and then there's you, the dean. Could you imagine if they were like they had a, a very special episode of Facts of Life where they were all learning how to play Dungeons and Dragons from Gary Gygax? <laughs> That would have been, I think that would have been just you know, amazing. You know, I it would have been mind blowing. And, you know, I, I, sorry, go ahead, Tanya. No, I was just saying, I'm like, I didn't know what D&D was until like 1992. And I mean, right, I'm, it was I'm your a child husband. of the 70s and the 80s also. And I, I was just so sheltered that I had no clue what it was until yeah. I met my boyfriend at the time who was playing D&D. And I'm like, what's that? And he goes, oh, it's blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, Ooh, I'm like because I'm an avid reader and things like that, uh-huh. and I like the fantasy, I like the Star Wars and things uh-huh. like that. But I it, truly, I'm one of the only three females that are at the table, and I'm jumping back into DMing tomorrow. Well, that's the mystique, isn't it? I mean, we all grew up in the in the gaming groups, and and Ethan, I'm probably sure you can you can agree that the, you know a, a girl gamer was like one of those rare mythological creatures that was like you know right up there with the terrace. You never saw <laughs> oh one. Oh my god! And no, but dice it, get thrown it really, across it the never room. Never was for me. But, but that start- was that was your experience. But your experience is not common to everybody yeah, else's. I, it's just, I never really was able to wrap my mind around it. I mm-hmm. mean, I started playing in middle school, mm-hmm. but I didn't start playing regularly until my senior year of high school, mm-hmm. and I was one of four women at the table. We yeah. had, we, half of us were, were girls. So that just, so when people say, oh, girls don't play, I'm like, Really? <laughs> See, no, but that, I, I was at least blessed. The people I played with, whenever you know, we did have a girl at the table or girls plural, which did actually start happening. Uh, we were very cool with it. You know, we weren't one of those groups that were like, "Oh no, girls don't play this game." Uh, you know, we were able to say, "Okay, cool, girls at the table, great, that's great." That brings a whole different dimension to it. Now, Ethan, as, as basically as a DM of an all girl all group, group. Um, you know, you're, do these girls understand that they're kind of getting into a culture that has? Almost a level of gatekeeping to it in some, in still some circles. Almost. Well, no, there's oh, a yeah. lot of them. It's oh, very yeah. accepting. And, you know, I wasn't sure. Yeah, I wasn't sure if they would have a sense of this as sort of like just just a game, like a board game, and that there was no kind of historical gender bias in it at all. But they definitely like. I have actually. I, I did a couple of recordings with them recently, uh, where I I did some kind of Q and A, and I asked them, you know, what do you think about this, and how do you feel about. Um, you know, like I, I post on Twitter about them and I ask them, you know, how do you guys feel? You know, we talk about it. And I said, well, how do you feel about, you know, the, the support from the community? And their response was very much that they felt like it was really important to be to be vocal about them as a group playing because they wanted to encourage other girls to play D&D because they knew that it was historically viewed as a, a boys game. Mm-hmm. Awesome. That's great. That's good. And it can be empowering, too. You get to be the hero. You know, and and yeah. the girls yeah. the girls learn that you know to to problem solve and to work together as a team and to be the hero and to take that yeah. charge and the initiative and be the leader. It's a lot of social interaction. It is. It's a huge amount of social interaction. To, uh, conflict resolution. Conflict resolution. Social justice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, it's yeah. That's it's, just it's, awesome. It's, yeah. It opens a huge uh, and, door. And actually, Tanya, I wanted to uh, to to just build on that. You said conflict resolution, and of course, you can do conflict resolution conflict resolution in the game, right? Mm-hmm. So you're you're resolving conflicts with you know NPCs or monsters, and you can also there's also conflict resolution for us at the table. So, and I, I mean, I think we've all had that experience as well at a table <laughs> where you have to kind of you know somebody gets somebody gets cranky about something, yep. right? And you have to deal with it. And deal that that part of the game for us has been great because I've been able to kind of say, okay, like. Let's press pause for a moment. Let's talk a little bit about, I can sense, you know, there's some people that are unhappy right now, and let's deal with that. Let's talk about it and talk through it. Right. And that kind of social and emotional growth that occurs at the table is a huge benefit of the game, and it's been really positive for the groups of girls. I've seen some great, fast friendships develop at the table between girls who didn't even know each other, between, and between grades which is really mm-hmm. unusual. That's well, good. let That's... the girls know there is still crying at the table at the age of 46. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's something I wanted to ask We've about. So I'm, gr- I'm, oh. I'm, I'm thrilled you got talking about that because that was something I was going to ask about. Yeah. No, that's awesome stuff. Now, how, did, how does the story start? I want to switch gears real quick. How does the story start for you? you you're a child of the 70s and 80s, much like I am. I, I think we're pretty much the same age, you and I. Um, 
And and so how does the story start for you? You 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 were born and raised in the heartland of D and D. Um, so how does that yeah, work? Yeah, so I mean, I so I I was born and raised in Central Wisconsin, and mm-hmm. uh, that well, born in Chicago, but by care my folks uh, being hippies moved out into the woods, <laughs> and then eventually we moved to a, a small town of about four thousand people, and you know that that was such a you know, it was a time when you could be bored, and I think that the, that I don't want to say that that's missing today, but it's a lot easier to, to be distracted by social media, by mm-hmm. video games, and what have you. And I grew up with computers. I grew up with uh, with books, and you know, it was a different time where there was a lot of time just sort of sitting around reading the monster manual, the Dungeon Master's Guide. Mm-hmm. Um, that and you know, like I was a nerd. I was boy, and let me tell you, being a nerd back in the like late seventies, early eighties in rural Wisconsin, you really had to work at it. <laughs> I was in the Doctor Who. You had to put some effort into you know, it. I, like I was, I was in the Doctor Who, the Doctor Who fan club in rural Wisconsin, which was like twenty people. Yeah, right. And uh, you know, we we distributed flyers, <laughs> like like a cult kind of. <laughs> but uh, you know, that was. He's one that, of you. that was what it was like back then. And so, you know, to take and to, to sit around and to read the Dungeon Master's Guide and to draw a map and to develop campaigns that never got played, mm-hmm. um, I've heard that described as lonely fun. And it, yet, it's uh, to me, that's kind of a core part of the game, to kind of sit and to, to just read through the books and to experience it as an individual, not always necessarily in a group. To um, this day, and it was, you know, a handful of us that played. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To this day, I roll yeah, up ahead, characters Tanya. for fun. No, this is Sherry. <clears throat> to this day, I roll up characters oh, for fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> well, and yeah. in the the yeah. game that we're going to start tomorrow, just to thwart Scott that likes to have fifteen million different character concepts going on in his head, I have the the foundations of all ten characters, nice. and they're randomly getting one. Yes. Nice. So there's the anti Scott it, rule. It's the yeah, it's basically the anti Scott rule. But that's just random because uh-huh. our group has been playing together for so long that they're willing to do everything and anything and they're willing to go, Okay, we'll trust you on yeah. this type thing and because one I wanted to push a couple of them out of their normal comfort zones type thing. This is also the first time Tanya's been a DM in a very long time. Yes. So, so this I'm is gonna a little be fun. afraid. So you're working on interpersonal skills within your group I as am. well. I'm See? also going to be working on not crying. <laughs> oh, you're going to be fine. You're gonna be fine. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. You're going to be fine. So, But no, that group will be either like uh, eight or nine people around the table. Depends on if Christopher decides to join us or not. Yeah. I've been kind of taking a break lately because I'm in the process of buying a new house. So I'm just overwhelmed with everything right now. So I've kind of stepped back from my gaming tables. Um, but it's good for you. Yes, I, you, you know, need to come back. I need a break. Okay, um, so let's get let even get back to his. I was working on that. Yes, I know. I'm working the on that. Yeah, sure. sure. I, I, know I got I got one off topic question real quick because you mentioned the Doctor Who Society. So who was your first doctor? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I don't know if he was my first doctor, but for me, the doctor is Tom Baker. See, there you go. Yeah. Okay. And that's who I saw yeah. first. And by the way, so, when, he, when he said I mean, that before. You know, when, when I think about Doctor Who, that's who pops to mind. You know, probably yeah. it was John Pertree, Pertree um, Tom Baker, uh, Peter Davidson. Was right. Sort of, that was my... That was my really Tom Baker and Peter Davis. That's see, that's that's my jam. Everybody talks yeah. about favorite TV shows. It, it's been that since I was eight. So I'm yeah, you know, I'm right there with you. As soon as he said that, I uh-huh. said part of the ship, part of the crew. There it is. Yeah. That's it exactly. You, you you're, yeah, <laughs> definitely part of the family at this point, Ethan. Um, and now yeah. you you have a, sorry we're keeping you. You've had an opportunity to meet no. the current leadership at this point. You've you've had an interaction with Jeremy Crawford and I believe Kate Welch as well came out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, no. It's been amazing. I mean, listen, you know, the, thank you, thank first you. of all, the D&D community is always, you know, pretty welcoming community with mm-hmm. some exceptions, but overall very welcoming. And um, and it's just been great. You know, we've gotten a lot of support. Um, people have donated, uh, you know, Mike Shea slash Sly Flourish, who wrote a couple of very popular RPG books. He donated a bunch of money to us early oh, on. Oh, wow. We were able okay. to buy books. And yeah, just it's been it's been fabulous because otherwise, you know, we really were kind of running with nothing. It was a pretty lean operation, mm-hmm. and uh, so I reached out. You know, I, I occasionally would see that um, some of the Wizards of the Coast people would favorite something on Twitter, and I so I, so I just like randomly was like, "Hey, you guys should come by. We're real close." And once they realized that we were just you know around the corner, obviously that helps. But they were like, "Yeah, sure, we'll swing by," and they did. And the girls, you know, Jeremy Crawford came. 
and Kate Welch came, but this is an all girls school. Mm -hmm. So nobody, I don't want to say nobody noticed Jeremy like they did, and he was great, but everybody remembers Kate Welch. (laughs) You know, there's this this woman who works on D&D. Yeah. And so it was great. They just asked him, you know, the girls got to sit there and talk to uh, these folks who are are building this amazing product that they love and uh and you know obviously are, they were super inspiring so that that was just wonderful and they got to see a role model that's wonderful exactly you absolutely know, yeah. you know when yeah yeah we interviewed jeremy crawford how many it's a couple ago months now? ago we got to have jeremy crawford on the show the man made me cry oh, oh he was repeatedly. phenomenal because you can tell the, the the people i can respect the most are the people who are deeply involved you know in what they do for the love of it you know, yeah, you're in a successful business. Yeah. You're making money hand over fist right now, and but that's like that's like secondary, sometimes even tertiary, with the way that Jeremy was talking about it. You could just just the sheer love of being able to share this experience with people, and to write new material, and to see people's reaction to, to the things that he has helped create, and it just that was it was really it was amazing to, to chat with him. And and the normal run run of the mill yeah, person, no, no, I, he answers on Twitter yeah. all the time. Yeah, it's it. wonderful. Had... Go ahead, Ethan. Yeah, I, I really had that same sense. He really, like, they, they really care about the community. Mm-hmm. They care about the quality of the product. They care about inclusivity. And, it boy, does that come through. Yeah. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah, I'm starting to tear up again. Look at you. We're losing Chris. <laughs> uh, think he's a marshmallow. <laughs> now, well, listen, let me, let me just tell you. Let me wrap up it. my story real quick, though. Um, absolutely. Want to hear I, I actually just mentioned, you know, I, after so after leaving Wisconsin and so you know I, I went off to college and I played a little bit in college but that it, my uh, role play I actually moved abroad for about twelve years and I didn't play at all. Oh wow! Okay, uh, that's a job. I, I really, and I really, I really missed it. Yeah, sorry, you're saying. No, no, I'm just saying that's devastating. That's that you didn't devastating play. to be that I, far I away get from upset the table when I don't play for a week. <laughs> she does. It's crazy. She so crazy. I can't imagine I twelve years. And I, you know. I think about it now, and I'm like, oh, it's just horrible to think like I kind of missed all this opportunity and time. But a part of it was living abroad. At that point, um, there was not I, I didn't have a readily accessible role playing game community, mm-hmm. um, and I wasn't. And there was there were language barriers, and I just didn't. You know, there was not a lot of opportunity. But uh, coming back to the states uh, is when I sort of you know after I, it was I guess in the 4.0 era, and I was not into for that version for that yeah. much. So I just didn't pick up playing that. But what got me back in was a, a buddy of mine, Trevor Bramble. He introduced me to playing uh, DCC RPG. Okay. Which is where I picked up the whole level zero thing, uh, which is sort of an old school, you know, D&D-esque uh, game. And then from there, you know, branched off and, and started to pick up D&D again uh, with version five, which I love. I yeah. think 5e is great. Yeah, I mean, I've really been enjoying five. Um, I, I skipped over four. I remember getting the player's handbook and for completeness sake of my collection and Us reading too. reading through it, opening it up a couple of times and closing it almost immediately because like, well, if I want to play an MMO, I'll just crank up World of Warcraft, you know, and that was, that was kind of my yeah. whole my whole yeah. opinion of four. Um, yeah, we, we didn't play for t- just over 20 years. Yeah, I know. It was a big drought for you. For yeah, all. and when 5e came out, it was like playing the original again. It's, so the we vibe was thrilled. there in the book. Yeah, the vibe was definitely in the book. It was amazing. <clears throat> and now we got the kid doing it, and yep. we've gotten in a couple really yeah, big our, groups. It's our been Our 19-year-old daughter loves to play. Awesome. Yeah. And I think that's part of the elegance of 5th of edition is that it's so easy to pick up, and it's so kind of deep and rich. It's got that same vibe, and that makes it easy for brand new players to kind of jump in. 3-5... Three five and Pathfinder are like you got to you got to know what you're There's doing lots of information. because it's so complicated. Yeah. Um, so to kind of dive in there as a beginner would be very daunting. But with fifth edition, it's easy for somebody who's mm-hmm. brand new to the table to pick it up. So it's perfect for you know for middle schoolers. Mm-hmm. You know, so can get you get you into the the yeah. whole rhythm of things. Uh, well, some friends of ours, their um, their eleven and twelve year old played their first session. On Tuesday. See, that's, I love that. that yeah. love Riker, my nine year old, keeps asking, When can I play? When can I play? When can I play? And I'm like, When you're 12. <laughs> Only because I yeah. need him to be able to be settled a little bit. Because yeah. he's got, I mean, he's played like the board game Talisman and things like that. So right. we've done that. But have a bit of cognitive thinking. That's yes. it. That's uh, it. The, the attention span, more than 30 seconds. <laughs> of a goldfish. Oops. Why'd you let me play then? It- because we had to teach you your attention span. Oh. Yeah, we had to. <laughs> anyway. Um, What's that over there? Ethan, 
what would be as you have you have done this you've laid the groundwork at this point what would be kind of the recommendations you'd have for others who would want to start like a similar club at, at a school level or, or or even just at a local level oh yeah I, so this is a question i've gotten i've had a lot uh come in on twitter and i would say so you know a couple of things one um don't bite off more than you can chew. Like, don't don't introduce a big, heavy campaign right away. Okay. Uh, I think it's important to kind of start simple. Um, I I try to keep it pretty pretty basic and a little old school with the girls initially. A part of, you know, listen, part of that is also because I want to introduce uh, just the general concepts of, of role playing games and, and sort of the classic D and D experience. So we did a lot of you know basic dungeon crawl. But I, I love the idea of starting simple and removing stuff from the game. Mm-hmm. And I know that that seems anathema to a lot of folks because the rules are the rules. And I'm not I'm not changing the rules, but I think you should feel free to not play with certain rules or not not introduce certain concepts right away. Keep mm-hmm. it simple, keep it kind of stripped down and, and streamlined. If it's a if it's a newer group, obviously if you're playing with experienced players, it's a different story. Um, number two, I would say don't. Uh, don't expect to be playing if it's like uh, middle schoolers. You don't, you're not going to be playing for You could play for three hours, but things are going to break down. Mm-hmm. We play generally for two-hour sessions with a couple of breaks, a couple of five-minute breaks. And that's about, especially for us on a Friday night, let me tell you, that's that's about it. Yeah. Uh, my elective class, by the way, you know, I'm playing during the day. We have one-hour sessions, mm-hmm. and that happens twice a week. So we do, we do two hours, but it's broken out into two, you know, that's total time each time is just one hour uh i would love to have more time with the girls for that but I, on the other hand you know attention spans are a real thing you, you're really bringing up a real subject and mm-hmm. uh, i think it works out pretty well to keep it tight uh keep it short so keep it short keep the you know rules light uh fun heavy and you know one of the things i do and i recommend this as well is i keep a list of all the players names in front of me with their character name and i check off during the session Every time somebody gets a chance to do uh, something kind of heroic or epic or fun or crazy, uh, so that everybody gets a chance to do something crazy during the you know or fun or or um, you know as I call it a moment to shine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I want everybody to have a moment moment to shine during the session. Brilliant. And it's really easy. Yeah, it's really easy with kids uh, that are quiet, and I, this is true for adults as well, right? But mm-hmm. it's easy to let players who are they tend to like lean back a little bit more. It's easy to let them lean back and to to just let the the vocal players engage. And especially with kids, I think it's important to try to draw out those quieter players. If you're an adult and you're feeling quiet, um, and that's your comfort that's your comfort space, fine. But with the middle schoolers that I play with, I've seen girls who didn't. You know, they didn't utter a word for the first couple sessions. Now they're not only are they some of the most um, engaged and active. I've seen them migrate from talking about their character in the third person to now talking about their character in the first person. Oh, see, there you go. Role playing. Now they're that's, feeling that's it. Amazing. Now they're they're investing themselves into yeah. it. That's outstanding. Now, are yeah. you finding that are the girls like they're starting when they, when it comes to creative writing? Are they starting to write little like little vignettes about their characters and interacting with each other? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, so I actually asked the. I commissioned uh, an artwork for the girls uh, mm-hmm. in my my Friday night club, um, and uh, an amazing, beautiful piece that I, that I posted on Twitter a couple of times by uh, Kayla Klein, who is currently she she plays D and D online, and she's an amazing illustrator. And so she, I to to help her along, I asked her backstories from all my players, and you know, a couple of the girls I got about a paragraph from, but then you know, a couple of the players wrote pages and pages oh, of wow. story, like almost like little novellas so you know it's been that's that's been amazing to see and you know just the arts that they've started to do and and they're you know they're playing in the summer like i, I know at least i have uh, probably six girls i know of right now who are just they've managed to put together little games during the summer either with their family or with their friends or with other girls from school very cool oh that's just so cool you know and that's you know it's for me, I've, and I've talked about this on several occasions, and in like you know, we implied earlier, we did have uh, Jeremy Crawford, and we did an interview with him a couple months ago, so we got a chance to talk to him about it. Is, you know, 30 years ago plus, when we were all first getting into this game, you know, we were, you know, you're kind of hiding almost a little bit, you know, in the back room. Don't, you know, don't, hopefully the people who are cool don't notice us because then they'll pick on us, and right. we're playing this game in secret, and now we're mainstream. You know, so it's like, it's just an amazing thing. <laughs> and it's an amazing time to be a gamer. Yeah. It is the age of the geek. It is the age. Say. The geek shall inherit the earth. And that's all I got to say at that point. Um, 
There's something, something. There's something that Ethan uh, just did on his Twitter that I'd love for you to talk about. Okay. Um, about the the book recommendations you were asking for. <laughs> yes, that was. So let me give you some background on that. Um, I so this is actually in preparation for the summer camp. I've been considering, you know, sort of uh, assigning some, uh, I don't want to call it homework, but, you know, a little bit of preparatory work for the girls that are going to be part of the summer camp. And, and even for the girls that are going to be coming into my club and the elective classes coming year, I want to have some sort of a primer on what I, what I, this is not my term, but, you know, the, what fantasy land in Dungeons and Dragons is. In other words, like sort of what the stock medieval fantasy setting is in D&D. And, you know, you can play Planescape and Dark Sun, and you can play all these different settings, but the stock setting, and I don't just mean, like, Forgotten Realms, I mean, like, the generic setting of D&D mm-hmm. and those general concepts and that kind of, that Tolkien-esque um, experience of, of fantasy, a lot of the girls just have never, they've never seen the, like, I was shocked, actually, at how many girls had never even, like, had never read or seen any of the Hobbit uh, content or oh, the wow. content or Lord of the Rings. Yeah, real, I was actually genuine. I kind of expected everybody to have been exposed to that in some way, but no. And so really just giving them a background on the idea of, okay, dwarves and elves and things like this, uh, or, or generic fantasy concepts or generic medieval history concepts uh, delivered in, a fantasy, in fantasy literature, I was looking for something for them to read. And of course, you know, again, this goes back to my experience in the 80s, 70s and 80s growing up. Fantasy that reflects boys, there's a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and token, it's all, it's all, almost all boys in the story. Right. But I wanted, so I wanted young adult fantasy with a strong female protagonist as the main character. And I was having a hard time finding content like that. So I, I sent out a tweet saying, hey, what, you know, can you, can Twitter, can you help me find some good works of fantasy literature that have a strong female protagonist <laughs> as the main character and which exist in a D&D like world? And so I got back. So this, this then absorbed my life for about three days. <laughs> and you know, I was amazed at the number of responses. I mean, it was hundreds and hundreds of responses from folks. The unique, uh, overall, I think the unique list is about 100 entries right now. And about 50 of those have multiple votes. Um, maybe 20 or 30 of those have more than 10 mm-hmm. votes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there, and there's some great, there's some great work. And, you know, it's shocking to me. Tell me. I didn't know most of these. Oh, really? So it was even I, a surprise yeah, to you. I, 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 yeah. That's yeah awesome. I like uh, Tamora Pierce. Number one response without yes. exception. And Absolutely. I'm, ash- you know, I'm kind of ashamed. I, I, I'm rec- ashamed I recommended the, the I recommended those books to you when you were asking about it. Oh, and thank you. And she actually is kind of local to us. Is she's, she? She's in Syracuse. Have, and, and, and 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 this is where I'm about to get beat from to, from a co-host and a producer. I don't know who this person is. Me neither. She wrote. A, <laughs> she wrote um, the, the first series of books she uh-huh. wrote was called. Um, oh my God! The, I, it's, it, it, I've got into it because the first book's called oh. Alana. Oh, okay. Oh, the, Song, of the, the Lioness. Lioness. Song yeah, right. of the Lioness. Song of the Lioness. And I've read Song of the Lioness and um, The Protectorate of the Small. Okay. And they're books about female knights. Huh. And they're uh, just amazing books. I will they're add them really to the amazing. very large stack of books accumulating <laughs> in my soon-to-be reading room. The one that I've read over and over and over again is by Elizabeth Moon, The Deeds of Back- Paxenarian. And that's on his list. Okay. And there's been 12 mentions. That's like one of the first ones that I go to. Yeah. And I have so many books that I have to catch up on someday. I don't think I'm, you know what? I think I'm going to have to live to about 150 to catch up on all the books that I, I've been slated to read. And the Enchanted Forest Chronicles, I know, are on there. And that's a great series because yep. it turns the entire fantasy idea on its head. It's about a princess who runs away to go live with dragons <laughs> and, does, and doesn't want to be rescued. I'm headed there myself. Yep. <laughs> I'm going. Yeah, that's that's um, Patricia Reed. I yes, yes. Or, yep. Right? I'm writing that one down yeah. right now. All right. <laughs> I have Kindle Unlimited. Yep. I'm starting. <laughs> I've got Kindle Unlimited, and I'm not afraid to use it. Oh, I'm going right now. Uh, go ahead, Chris. You and I, you and I were in the same boat in this. We like. I'm I'm ashamed that I did not know these people. Yeah. I grew up. You know, I grew up reading fantasy fiction and. So this is, you know, I'm trying to to make amends here a little bit, and also I'm trying to find to find these pieces these pieces of fantasy literature that really 
inspire uh, young girls and mm-hmm. are appropriate for um, middle schoolers and which have these strong female leads. And so I, I've published, and I'll, I'll keep publishing this on Twitter. Uh, I'll probably post it again. Uh, but I, I have the spreadsheet to the public. Uh, people can comment on it if they have new additions or if they have opinions about whether or not something matches the D&D setting. So. Yeah. I just followed well, you on Twitter while Sherry was talking about yeah, the book. So I'm of, like, okay, now. No, no. <laughs> a lot of the ones that I suggested other than the Tamora Pierce aren't the, the typical middle, just uh, the, the more British versions, like mm-hmm. like Middle Earth type things. Um, like the ones that I suggested to you from uh, Sarah Beth Durst. Um, there, if you want to get into other settings, like the main one that I suggested was was Vessel, and that is set in a desert, mm-hmm. and Ice is set in the great far north, and so those are interesting when you start getting to other settings. Okay, you've looked at the list. Has anybody mentioned uh, the Tiffany Aching books? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Great. Tiffany yeah. Aching, actually, Terry several, Pratchett, several yeah. Terry Pratchett's oh, yeah. mentioning, especially mm-hmm. the Tiffany Aching. Yeah, ter- Terry Pratchett is currently the third most popular i think on the list nice third or fifth should that's be. specifically yes. the tiffany aching books yeah they, yes. they were some of my absolute favorites and maybe maybe take first yeah it's um, between those and the guards books yeah so. and um as far as if you want to go even younger books there's an amazing picture book called the paper bag princess um by robert munch oh. Um, it was our daughter's one of her absolute <laughs> favorite, favorite books. books, and it was about a it's about a princess. Um, her castle is burned down by a dragon, and the dragon takes the prince instead of taking the princess. <laughs> and she all of her clothes are burned up, so she puts on a paper bag and she puts on her crown and she goes to save her prince. And did not to, spoilers right here. Uh, when she gets done and she saves him, and his response is, "Well, your hair is a mess, and you, you have you wearing a paper bag, and we'll go away and come back when you are when you look more like a princess." And she said, "Well, your hair is perfect, and your clothes are lovely, but you are a jerk." <laughs> and she went away, and she lived happily ever after. <laughs> It's just such an awesome, awesome. book, and they That's actually great. made a cartoon out of it, which was a lot of fun, too. Another one that um, I actually have in my classroom at school um, is uh, Dragon Slippers and its sequels. It's um, a younger read. It's, like, um, ages 10 and up. Okay. But, um, so it's right, It's appropriate but, for me is what you're yeah. saying. Yes, it's just the day, George, and I see it's on, on your list, and I'm like, oh, wait, what is that one? And I'm like, sure enough, mm-hmm. I just pulled up the book, and I'm like, yep, that's the ones that I have currently in my classroom. And I teach high school, and but... I teach math. So, so. <laughs> one one gamer to another, and oh. yeah, because I got she's you got the fellow teacher over here who's going to go on a whole educational tangent. But, no, but no. one gamer to another, right, right quick. I have to ask the basic question: Your favorite character you ever played? Oh, gee, that's a great question. Um, probably a ranger. I, okay. You know, for me, like in the eighties, like it was, a, I always played a ranger. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know why that is. You know, actually, stop I looking say, at me. I, I do know why that is. And this is actually related to the whole the whole world of D and D today and streaming. You know, I feel like a lot of the the settings, and we see this with the Waterdeep, the recent Waterdeep release. But yeah, a lot of the D and D that I see played online uh, on Twitch or that I the, the recent setting releases, I have a very urban feel to them, urban fantasy feel to to them. Yeah, and you know, I well, like I, I grew up in in rural Wisconsin, and so and it, you look at a lot of the early D and D settings, and it was very much like a rural kind of tromping through the woods. Uh, setting and so for me, like if you were going to play D and D, or you wanted to imagine yourself in D and D, Ranger was a, a real natural fit. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and that's what I've done with most of my adult life was become a ranger. Yep, <laughs> yep. Chris, Chris actually is a ranger in real life, and he's even got the animal companion. <laughs> Big fat, a, uh, big, big fat red dog. Big fat red dog. dog. <laughs> um, that should be a question yeah. of the day. It's a great question. It is a great question. I mean, and your favorite, what, what was your, did you ever like, did you do a lot of homebrew or did you do modules or a mix of both? Me? Oh, it was all modules growing okay. up. For sure, all modules, which is, I, I shouldn't say all modules. Like, it, I, I guess when I started, when I was playing in college, it was homebrew. Then I was like, okay, I am writing my own settings, mm-hmm. which I think was probably just a way to avoid writing term papers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not the worst motivation. No. Um, and now, now of course, I really prefer doing homebrew, and you know, I or or using very loose, you know, uh, module content, mm-hmm. pulling bits and pieces out, and then 
rereading it. But no, I, I love to do homebrew stuff now. Okay, so if you did early modules, let me throw out a few names and you tell me if you've played them. Um, Temple of Elemental okay. Evil. No, have not played. <gasps> me I neither. Have- I, I have. It's a I know you one. have on several occasions, oh, Tanya, it's but nasty. I, I've never played it. I've we've heard about. S- we've skipped a lot of the elemental levels. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, uh, what were some of the other ones I did? Uh, White Plume Mountain. Uh-huh. Um, the the giant series. We've, the Underdark against the giants. You'll have to talk to my husband about how we forayed against the giants. There you go. <laughs> The, um, the thing is, I've never, ever I played can, a module. I can save you some time. I can save you some time on the early module list because, so growing up, I mean, I was, we were, my parents are both teachers, so we were pretty poor, which is, you know, the state of education of the United States. Yeah. <laughs> That's really, <laughs> really, and, really sad. Yeah. It's, it's Right. I mean, it was, I had a very happy childhood, but, you know, I just not a lot of money to spend. And so right. I didn't buy a ton of modules. We would just play the heck out of the, the, the modules that I did have, which was like, I had one of the Slavers modules. Uh-huh. I had Castle Amber, uh, mm. Castle Amber, which I loved and played, played a ton of that. Ben and that and then one. also, of course, keep on the borderlands. Oh, that's the classic. That's that, it. That's the one they're She's starting the, tomorrow. Yeah, yeah Tiny, Tiny got a cap, copy of the fifth edition version of it. She's going to no, be my playing. my husband had it. Oh, well, it's you know. a huge book. You see, you got to understand, Tiniest Husband, I Randy. I've, I've had, got a huge book. Yeah, it's, it, and I find like the first like 100 some odd pages are just the original modules again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tiniest Husband, Randy, has, yeah. has a, a, yeah. one of the more entertaining illnesses ever. He has an eBay addiction, and, <laughs> and he's been a gamer for longer than you and I have. So his entire basement is just nothing but bookshelves of, of D&D books, multiple versions of them, ah. all editions, and then every other role-playing game out there. He's got the full functional library. Like Traveler and Star Wars yeah. and yeah. Star Trek and and Deadlands and first basic. We've got, like, I think 10 copies of the Rules Cyclopedia. Oh, you've got, like, 20 copies of the Monster Manual, the first edition Monster Manual. Yeah. It's just, but it's, we only have, like, one copy of the deities and demigods that have yes. the Cthulhu metho- mythos in it. Yes. So. Okay. okay, so does he have oh, Teenage nice. Mutant yeah. Ninja Turtles? Yes. Chances are. He actually, no, he does, because he gave me the CD copy of it. Yes. Yay. Uh-huh. So <laughs> you, you I'm going to be it. I'm gonna be running that. <laughs> you say it, he probably has it. Yeah. So... Send Sherry a list of what you need. I'll try to sneak some of it out of the basement. You got it. And, and Ethan, if you ever need any ideas. <laughs> that would be Ethan. Thank there you, Ethan. <laughs> Not you, Chris. Oh, He's come on. Ethan. Come on. And Ethan, if you ever need ideas for homebrew, I've got binders worth of stuff that I've written over the past 25 to 30 years. You're, you're welcome to it, man. And if the girls need dice, I have dice. Oh, we got more. <laughs> the dice addiction is real. So send us a list of needs, yeah. and um, you know, we'll te- see what we can do. Being a teacher, that, that's the one thing I like. Yeah, teachers like kind of supply half mm-hmm. of the stuff in their classroom. So I've yep. I've sure supplied do. our, our oh. new gamer Ariel. She was oh, yeah. she didn't have dice or whatever. I'm like, here, what color do you want? She goes, I like purple. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> do you want this purple? Yeah. This purple? This purple? This purple? Yeah, no. So I mean, that's yeah. No, the thing. first. The first dice for the the Friday Night Club. It was all came from my dice collection. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Um, and then later on, Tabletop Loot donated a bunch of dice. Oh, nice. nice! Awesome. We we have some of their dice. Yeah. They they do nice dice. Well, Ethan, I'd love to have this conversation with you again in the future if you don't mind just calling you again. Yeah, no, I'd love to. I, I think it'd be good to kind of revisit and see how things have developed. And you know, this like this past year was just crazy because it was all kind of seat of the pants. Um, right. You know, let's throw together Friday night. Let's do the elective kind of just on the fly. And uh, you know, I, this next year for me is really going to be the a more mature product in a way. And hopefully, the you know the girls will have a, a even deeper experience with it. And we're going to have. Uh, you know, double-digit gamers this next year again. Wow. So, yeah, I'd love to revisit this. Thank you I would so much for to. having me on. Absolutely. It's been a great conversation, and appreciate your time today. Uh, and and I'm looking forward to hearing of, of the girls' adventures and, uh, and w- what they're up to. Um, so for everybody here, thank you to Ethan Schoonover for thank being on the you. show with us today. Thank you very, very, very much. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and as I say to all of my fellow gamers, roll for initiative. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to do events, upcoming events, and our question of the week. Just going to go to break with some appropriate music here. Beautiful. <laughs> no, no. You take the bag, you take the phone, and there you have the facts of life. The facts of life. That one, that's going to earworm into Ethan's head, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> the facts of life. The facts of life. Goodbye. <laughs>
That was such a great conversation. It was. He's already accepted my friend request on See, Facebook. See, that's awesome. I'll, I'll, probably, I'll friend him as well so I can keep an eye on things because I definitely want to have him back on the he's, You know what would be great? Mine too. Sherry, you know what would be great? What is if we great? could get John Kovalik, Jeremy Crawford, and Ethan Schoonover all in the same conversation. That would be amazing. I think that would be an insane panel to talk about gaming with. Absolutely. Two to three hours. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that would be a, spe- a very special episode of Monkey Business. That would kind that- of like leave um, putting the convention over to Michael, Greg, and Austin. Yeah. That's, that'd <laughs> just, be, it'd be we would right just up there. sit back and let them, <laughs> let them just take let over. Them just, yeah. Just let the three of them shoot the uh, shit for a couple of hours. My God. That'd be amazing. But no. that And I love what he's doing with the game. Can you hear me? I can hear you just okay. fine. Of course, Is you're sitting a... right next to me. No, I can hear. Uh, in she's the, fine. The headphones. Um, okay. So yeah, we'll, well, that's a thing that we'll have to do going forward. Um, we we got a shout out recently. Somebody f- shared our one of our more recent releases, and and uh, who was that person? It was eight. H.H. H. H. Carlin. H.H. H. H. Carlin. Carlin of Dread Vector. Of Dread Vector. So they did a huge shout out for us. And, and I, I want to just let them know how much I appreciated that. That was very cool of you guys to say that. High compliment. And I'd love to be able to talk with you guys a little bit more going forward. So so that's cool. I definitely want to we'll get that conversation going and find out a little bit more about Dread Vector. Um, we do uh, the everyday heroes things. You know, not all heroes, they wear capes. Uh, who is your hero? Do you know a fireman, a police officer, a nurse, an EMT, military personnel, teacher, librarian, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Who is your personal hero? If so, please let us know all about that person. We're going to give them a shout out on the air. Please send your nominations to fc 3 monkeybusiness at gmail.com. This week's Everyday Hero is Sarah Metat. Did mm-hmm. I say that correctly? Yeah. A nurse at St. Luke's Hospital for 19 years and is currently the charge nurse on the special care unit specializing in strokes. When Sherry's mother, Barb, was in a severe accident four years ago, uh, Sarah was one of the incredible nurses that took care of her, and Sarah went above and beyond. Already a personal friend of Sherry and Chris, Sarah called often when they couldn't be at the hospital, kept them apprised of Barb's condition. Uh, and I'm assuming keeps tabs on her to this day from time to time. She does. She, has she a, does. She actually she's been over to the house. That's amazing. She's, she's she was a friend of ours before my mother was in the accident. Oh, okay. So it was so wonderful going in and knowing that we knew a nurse that was going to be taking care. I have of her. a similar circumstance to that, so I understand that yeah. feeling. That's definitely a thing. Uh, in addition to being a nurse, Sarah is a Central New York rockabetty. And will be a pinup in the August edition of Retro Life magazine. I am looking forward to seeing that because those are just so freaking cool. And and if you'd like, afterward, I will show you a video of Sarah spinning fire last summer. Nice. Yep. Oh well, that's a thing. Oh, does she go to festival then? Yes, yep. she does. That's amazing. That's that's right. Festival that's, starts this weekend, doesn't it? No, next, next weekend. weekend. Well, oh, this it? weekend as of the drop date for this episode. Oh, okay. oh gotcha, 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 gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Hey, can, cool. can I interrupt for just a second? Go then, for it, as Billy. Long as you're doing the everyday heroes thing. That, Absolutely. This is a little bit off topic, but uh, sort of connected also. Yesterday, as of this taping, a uh, very famous comic book artist by the name of Steve yes. Dicko yes. died. Absolutely. Yeah. So I want to bring him up. In, in fact, uh, a, com- a New York comedian by the name of Michael Lawrence wrote something on Twitter and Facebook that I thought was appropriate, and he he hosted he hosted a podcast called Nerd of Mouth that I really enjoyed. So okay, I, I just want to read what he wrote about. Go for Steve it, Dick, go. please. Uh, Thank you, Billy. There's few people I could say that have had an impact in my life that Steve Ditko has had. I've always loved Spider Man, but it wasn't until I was in high school that I read those old '60s issues in those phone book sized Marvel Essentials trades. I was very depressed then. I was very depressed then, and his work just spoke to me. His stuff, more than any other artist from the 60s, shined even brighter in black and white. I won't discredit Stan Lee, but there is no mistaking that Steve is what made Spider-Man tick, mm-hmm. or made, made Spider-Man stick out and matter culturally. Stan was the hype man who added flavor, but Steve was the kooky genius. Look at, uh, look at Spider-Man next to other heroes. He was gawky, scary even, not muscular at all. His life was fraught with constant pain, and you <laughs> felt it. And the villains, in his first 15 issues, he gave us the foundation of an entire rogues gallery. Vulture, Doc Ock, Sandman, Lizard, Electro, Mysterio, Craven, and Green Goblin. Then he also does Doctor Strange and gives us Baron Mordo, uh, Dormammu, Moo, and the living embodiment of Eternity. Then he left Marvel and created the question, Blue Beetle and the Creeper. He became a recluse and was always a weirdo. 
being the guy to tell Stan Lee to go F himself. <laughs> He's the J.D. Salinger of comics, a guy who spent his later years privately, not wanting any attention. He never cameoed, he never slept around at cons, and he probably never, he'd probably never want any tributes now. But no one deserves them more. He gifted us with the greatest superhero of all time, and even if he chose to be ignored, his work will never be forgotten. R.I.P. Steve. Wow. And Steve so. was 90 years old. <sighs> mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, he will be hugely missed. Yep. He ch- he changed the way we looked at at those types of things. It's just that's a loss right yeah. there. More than Spider Man gave us Peter Parker, who mm-hmm. uh, yeah, same person but very different. Yep, exactly. And okay. Marshmallow again. Uh, <laughs> and there goes Chris. There goes Chris. courtesy of Mike Lawrence, comedian. And that was a good write up too. Mm-hmm. That was really well written. Yeah. Um. Now, question of the week. Let's do the question of the week, and then we'll jump. Uh, into the rest of our day here. Uh, what fictional properties, games, books, movies, TV shows, etc., have you rage quit or dumped partway through, and why? Sherry? Oh, I'm going first? Yes, you're going to go first today. Um, well, you know, I'm an avid reader. Mm-hmm. I'm an avid fantasy reader. Mm-hmm. And um, I I don't know if it was a rage quit, but it was. I just couldn't do it anymore, it was, um, it was the Dresden books. The Harry Dresden books. The books or the TV show? The, oh, I love the TV show. Mm-hmm. Um, but the books. Okay. Um, it's just every time, every book, the bad guys got bigger and bigger and bigger. And the way it was taken care of was he just all of a sudden had these new powers every time <laughs> he turned. And I'm like, no, <laughs> this is just. You were taking it the wrong way. He was leveling up. Yeah. You know, That's it? No, it really was so. I, I just couldn't do it anymore. I got to about, I think I think I got through the fifth book. Mm-hmm. And then I'm just, nope, can't do it anymore. Yeah. And Ding, I just, level up. <laughs> and that, those, and there is a, a series by a woman named L.K. Hamilton, who. Um, mm. Lauren K. Hamilton. Laurel K. Hamilton. Laurel, yeah. Yeah, um, she wrote uh, uh, Supernatural books, and the first couple of books are the main character is strong female character. She's a um, necromancer, and uh, it, I mean, she's, she's solving. She's also a, a private investigator. She's solving all these mysteries, and then I don't, the, the author got a divorce, and I don't know if she stopped having sex. She started having more sex. I don't know, but the books <laughs> became all about sex. Oh, goody. Um, and I'm um, like, you know, I, it's, I just said I wasn't reading it for smut. <laughs> so, Book sex. Yeah. So when the, when the storyline started suffering because there was too much sex, I mm-hmm. stopped reading. Well, that sounds like a problem. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Billy, how about you? What, what fictional properties have you rage quit and why? I, I was thinking about this and not necessarily rage quit, but more financially quit. It's... Mm-hmm. Uh, Modern comic books, current comic books. You needed to collect everything to get a story now. It is tough. And I I can't. I don't want to. So I've I've had to stop it all. I don't want to collect every issue of The Flash so I can follow Batman's adventures. Exactly. it, so I, I just it's crossover back. disease. We yes, were talking about that at a comic book shop recently. Just it's called crossover disease. Crossovers now. and and everything's an event. Yeah, and yeah. I I just want stories. Mm-hmm. Pretend Stan Lee. I think it used to say, "Pretend uh, when you're writing comics, pretend every every comic is someone's first comic." Right. So I like self-contained stories. I, I'm with you on that one. I'm with you on that one. Tanya, how about you? Um, I can honestly say right now I have not rage quit or dumped anything in regards to books, games, movies, TV shows, that really? type of thing. You um, never just said enough is of this. I'm done. No. Hmm. I, I cannot. I'm like, I usually try to give something a chance and mm-hmm. I mean, I might put it on hold for a little while, but I eventually go back to it. Mm-hmm. But it's not something that I could see that I've dumped anything hmm. that I could, that I can like think about or identify right now it's something might come to me later but nothing that i can think of christopher politicians <laughs> <laughs> okay i'm with you on that one okay there we go <laughs> nazis yeah well, illinois I didn't rage, nazis i, didn't rage I quit. hate illinois, illinois nazis, nazis. I, I didn't rage quit them i, I never started yeah so, there you go yeah um anyways um well in gaming obviously you know you get in the middle of a, a game online and mm-hmm. you rage quit because um you're on dial up and everybody else is on <laughs> frickin' cable or yeah. DSL yeah. and you're you're walking 
and they're running past you and doing flips over you and jumping on your head, <laughs> and you know that gets irritating. So that that there were times when that happened, and that was in Quake Two: Weapons of Destruction. <laughs> but once I got online on uh, cable, that was a little different story. There we go. How about you, Ian Christopher? I haven't rage quit a game. I have rage quit part of a game. Yeah, right? exactly. I was there yeah, for one of those. Yeah. I remember that. SWAT tour. Yeah. Star Wars Old Republic. Yeah. There is a thing in this game called flashpoints. There is one flashpoint. Manon. In particular. It's the nemesis of my Manon. poor son. Every time I get Manon, I exit that tune. I deal with the <laughs> time s- that you have to wait. Go somewhere else. And I add another t- I have many tunes. Uh-huh. I don't need to play that one at the moment. Uh-huh. Just, just can't do it. Can't do it. I remember a time where you were, you were healing a dungeon for me in uh, World of Warcraft, and the, and the the guy who was like supposed to be DPS, he was doing damage, but he started healing a little bit off healing, and he was trying to help, but you didn't like I it. I couldn't do it. No. You couldn't do it. So you, you actually job. you actually quit. Oh wait, I think I was in that dungeon. You were in that yeah. dungeon with us. I was in that us. dungeon. Yeah, you know we we had people do that when we were playing Guild Wars. You know, mm-hmm. they weren't listening. Yeah, weren't listening, and they finally they got. Irritated and left. Mm-hmm. Well, if you'd been listening, you wouldn't have been irritated because we were trying to tell you what to do. Yeah. You stick to your job. He queued his damage. He should have damaged. He That's could have it. gotten out of his tank spec, okay? That's not my fault. <laughs> Try falling into the water and not knowing how, which way to go because you're new to the game. Yeah. <laughs> Hit level 60, you could fly. Problem solved. You yeah. go up. I, you go I was, up. I, uh, Chris had to come jump into the water out. and come get me. So I, it wasn't rage quit. I, I didn't quit it. I just was frustrated for that night, and I mm-hmm. I felt bad for everyone else because I was in tears because I just I know I was just like but you did I didn't well. Know you got out do. of it. It's okay. You, were you fine. changed characters. You swapped from a you've been happier now. Fighter to a mage. Yeah, except for when my Wi-Fi drops. Yeah, it kicks me out of the game. There you go. Then I'm like, oh, I guess I'm done for the night. <laughs> Yay! Sleep. <laughs> That's not rage quitting. I'm like, oh, I guess I'm going to bed. <laughs> so I've got three things that I've jotted down. To answer this question, the first thing that I, I know I definitely rage quit Final Fantasy X. Yeah. I was playing it on the console. I was playing it on our PlayStation 3 because I, I I bought it for Christmas for Ian and I ended up being the one playing it. But I got to this point where this one boss, just no matter what I did, I, I mean, I spent days working on this one boss. I couldn't get past it. I said, fuck this. And I'm to just drop the, drop the remote. And I, put, I put the game away and I've never gone back to it. Um, I walked out of the movie Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which I don't walk out of movies. But I got up and walked out because I was so disappointed. I had read, I had read, the, and I haven't even read the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy since then. But I used to watch, I used to read that book, which I got when I was twelve or thirteen years old. I read it once a year for like twenty years, and then when that movie came out, I was so excited and I was so disappointed. Halfway through the movie, I just got up, walked out, and I haven't gone back to that series ever again. That, that that's interesting because I love the book. I've loved the radio version. Yeah, the, the TV show I really love, mm-hmm. and the movie I just. Um, I, 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 it was more. Eh, eh, I, I I I didn't hate it as much as you. I didn't mm-hmm. love it. It just was eh, all right. I should have waited for DVD. Yeah, I, if I if I'd rented it and watched it yeah. at home, I probably would have had a different opinion. But you know, I just I guess I was looking forward to something because I knew the radio play and the TV series were off the book a little bit, but mm-hmm. they were both written by Douglas Adams, so I was okay with it. In fact, and, the radio was first. It was yeah. before yes. the book. And I know that the movie that Douglas Adams had had a hand in it before he'd passed away in terms of here's how the story goes and whatnot. But I, it just it was such a huge deviation. There were so many different things that were tweaked and whatnot. I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. So I, I walked out. Um, uh, I personally thought it was fun, you know. Yeah. Couldn't do it. Like the actors in it. So mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I love the actors in it. They were all great. I mean, I Zoe mean, Deschanel, I still have a freaking crush on. And Mar- Martin Freeman's amazing. Absolutely. You know? And Alan Rickman. S- is Sam Marvin. Rockwell, for God's sake. The guy is, you can't put him in anything. He's hilarious. You know, that whole thing with Zaphod mm-hmm. and the way they did the two heads, yeah. I thought was so different. Mm-hmm. Didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't love it. Yeah. But I thought it was different. It was well, it was definitely different. It was definitely interesting, but I didn't like it. was like, it. that was an interesting take on it. So but... now now that I've said that, Sherry's mentally putting that on her uh, next Not a Book Club <laughs> list. I've never Reasons seen Reasons why it, Chris so is wrong. There, there yeah. Were, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, she was saying the other day, we need to start debating again because the two of us, are we, we agree too much lately. Um... The third thing I have rage quit and given up on is Supernatural. I'm done with it. After they killed off Charlie, it took a nosedive, in my opinion. And then just those recent... The, I, I haven't actually watched it in almost oh, a year Oh, by the way, spoilers. 
<laughs> I'm only halfway yeah. through season twelve. I, I, I didn't yeah. rage quit it, but I lost a lot I, of. I my really lost just a lot of lost a lot of momentum season. on it. I've seen the Scooby Doo Super Scooby Natural. I haven't one. seen that because mm-hmm. I because I won't watch it until I can get to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I but didn't know Charlie died. Spoilers, so. Sam I'm sorry. Oh. I thought you did. No, are you okay. not there? No, no. Oh. I am much further behind because there are things that need to be done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm the one who does them. Yeah, so. Um, Never mind. She's fine. Everything's okay. <laughs> You'll see Felicia Day in a lot of things. Oh, yeah. Well, just, I will. Just, regardless. just not Supernatural. <laughs> the Legend of Neil. Actually, I thought... Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God, no. The, the new Mystery Science Theater 3000? There you that go. That is Felicia Day for me, is oh, The God, Legend of Neil. Have you seen The Legend of Neil? No, no, I haven't. Do not show it to your child. Okay. <laughs> but I recommend you look at it. She and I have gone to see Deadpool together. <laughs> no. This is beyond that? Legend of Neil was one of the very first web shows web mm-hmm. series and it was it was actually where Felicia Day got the idea for the guild okay because the person who created it was uh, uh Sandeep Parikh who's okay. in the, who's in the guild yeah 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 um it it's about a guy who's transported into the Legend of Zelda. The Legend of Zelda. But we won't tell you how that how we that happens. We won't tell you how that happens it's... because we'd have to y- hit the Spreaker button. Oh, I got it. Yes, <laughs> and, <laughs> and you would be like, "Tell us off, can- off oh, oh, our." Yeah, we, we may do that, we but will. you'd be like, <laughs> "I'm interested now." Wait, wait, wait what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what is it called? It's called the Legend of Neil. Mental note. Mental All note. All right. Neil. N e i l. So share the conversation. Feel free to tack on your comments to the Facebook post when we when we post this particular episode. What have you rage quit? Uh, Feel free free to tell Chris he's wrong. Yes, everybody else does. Yeah. Dad, you're wrong. Yeah, whatever. You're grounded. And uh, <laughs> so, from... no electronics for you, boy. <laughs> I, I think we're good. Are we good for this one? We can wrap this puppy up. I think so. And move on. So for uh, for Billy and for Tanya, for Sherry and for Chris, for Ian and myself, and for Sybil and Mike, who are in the room and waving at us at the moment. Yes, they are. See, look at that. This has been Monkey Business, a product of the Mighty Monkey Corporation, purveyors and producers of the Flower City Comic Con, coming at you once again in 2019. Follow us on Facebook, love us on Patreon, and talk to us on Twitter. And we will, guys, we will see you all next week. Have a great one. Enjoy it. Muffins.